Funding for Nova Science Now is provided by. Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your host for Nova Science Now. Wouldn't it be cool if the universe were like it is in a lot of movies? Filled with aliens, even intelligent life that we could meet and socialize with. Hey, mind passing the nuts? But if there are other creatures out there, where would they be? We've been searching the skies for a while now to find planets other living things could call home. And now planet hunters say they're tantalizingly close to that goal. Not nuts. <laughs> Most of us, when we're children, we look up into the night sky and we wonder what is our place in the universe? Are we somehow related to the stars, the planets? Are there other beings out there? The holy grail for me and for all of the astronomers working in my field is to find an Earth-like planet and especially a habitable Earth-like planet. Jeff Marcy has spent his career hunting for other worlds. But it's clear that not every world is friendly to life as we know it. What renders a planet indeed suitable for life? Well, clearly you want a planet that has some water on it, because water is the cocktail mixer that allows the chemistry of our bodies to even work. If we want a planet with liquid water, then it can't be too close to its star. That would make it too hot, and the water would boil away. And it shouldn't be too far away either too cold and you'll likely get an ice ball. What everybody really wants to find is a little rocky planet whose distance from its star is just right. A Goldilocks planet with oceans of liquid water. But hunting down a planet just like ours has been a daunting task. In fact, not long ago, we hadn't found any planets beyond our solar system. None at all. They're so far away and so dim they get lost in the glare of their own suns, the stars they orbit. It's like a lighthouse and having a tiny firefly next to the beam of this lighthouse. This is what you're looking for. So to improve their chances, most planet hunters, like Jeff Marcy, focus on stars. Here we go, first star, shooting. Wow, it looks beautiful. Fade out, complete. OK, we can go to the next star. Using the big, powerful Keck telescope in Hawaii, Jeff looks for slight wobbles in a star's position, signs that a planet might be orbiting. These planets do one thing that is just glorious. They're so massive that as they orbit the star, they pull gravitationally on the star. So if you just watch the star, you see it move to and fro. This so-called wobble method of planet hunting is a little bit like watching people walk their dogs. Watch the dog owner, never mind the, the dog itself, and the dog owner gets kind of yanked around as the dog goes to and fro. The idea is you don't have to see the dog itself to know that I'm getting yanked on by something. And of course, that's what we do. We watch stars that are being yanked on by their host planets. And of course, in that case, the leash is gravity. Thanks to the wobble method, Jeff and other hunters have so far tracked down hundreds of planets. Most of them are enormous balls of gas, like our Jupiter, which itself has 300 times the mass of Earth. And some orbit extremely close to their stars. They're so close skimming along the surface of the host star that these planets are blowtorched to 1,000, 1,500 degrees. So they're so hot that the organic molecules of which our bodies and other life forms on the Earth are made would disintegrate. It turns out, if we want to find more comfortable Goldilocks planets like Earth, there's a little problem with the wobble method. OK. If a hot Jupiter is like a big dog yanking on its owner, then Earth is kind of like this. It might be full of life and totally lovable, sure. But gravity-wise, it's kind of wimpy. It's just not going to have much of an influence. If you're only watching me, 
you might never know the dog was there. Same goes for a star out in the galaxy. The teeny tiny wobble caused by an orbiting Earth is really hard to detect. And that's why, despite all their successes, so far, we astronomers haven't found a single Earth, not one. If we want to find a place for life, we might need another method. Recently, I headed up to Mount Hopkins in Arizona to meet another planet hunter. One who's using an entirely different approach in the search for habitable worlds. Dave Charbonneau's experiment is based in an old shed. So this is the Mirth building. Once used to track Soviet satellites during this the Cold War. We'll slide back on these rails. As planet hunting projects go, this one is relatively low budget. Because unlike the wobble hunters, he doesn't need the biggest, most powerful telescopes. You know, when I walk into big observatories, I expect big telescopes. These look kind of puny to me. But there are lots of them. <laughs> Dave can use smaller, cheaper telescopes because in his search for habitable worlds, he's not looking for a wobble at all. It may be easier, instead of looking for the wobble, to actually look for an eclipse. We can see this kind of eclipse, or transit, right here in our own solar system, when Venus or Mercury passes between Earth and the Sun. But when the planet and its star are light years away, you can't see a round silhouette, but the star will appear to dim ever so slightly. And so the idea is as the planet passes around in front of the star, then it'll block some small part of the light, and so we'll measure this little miniature eclipse. Essentially, we'll measure that the star will get fainter for a short period of time. These kinds of transits are pretty rare, so Dave is casting as wide a net as he can, tracking a couple of thousand stars. That's why he needs a lot of telescopes, is the mirror. It's good. It's not right. Today, Dave and his team recruited me to help set up a few more. Telescope number seven. Is number seven. First thing we need is the mount. Let's do it. No matter how high tech the operation is, never leave home without duct tape. Well, this is the power cable. Power cable. And uh, this is the data cable. Power goes in, planets come out. <laughs> Just to make sure that nothing gets... Using this new transit method, Dave has already discovered several new planets. But so far, they're all the size of Jupiter, or bigger, and not habitable. A list of 2,000 stars that we want Now, to. he's hoping to improve his chances of finding a small Goldilocks planet by focusing his telescope on a particular kind of star called a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are much, much smaller and dimmer than our sun. So if a small planet passes in front of a red dwarf, it will block out a larger percentage of its light than if it had crossed in front of a bigger star like our sun. As sundown approaches, the roof of the shed slides away. And when the stars appear, the telescopes go to work, swooping around to point at one red dwarf and then another hunting for any trace of a transiting planet. The telescopes are designed to do their job alone on the mountaintop. But I saw evidence that they might have some visitors. Wait, wait, stop. There's, there's smudges on this mirror. Yeah. Um, un unfortunately, those appear to be paw prints. Paw prints? Yeah, we've, we've uh, come to realize recently that uh, it appears that some animal is coming in here um, perhaps during the night and uh, maybe looking at itself in the mirrors. Dave hasn't discovered the culprits yet, but whoever they are, they haven't stopped the telescopes from gathering thousands of images of stars. As the pictures come in, a computer immediately analyzes them, looking for the slightest dimming. The one right in the middle. Right. But the telescopes will see it only if the planet's orbit is aligned just right so that it passes between us and the red dwarf star. So you need star systems that are edge on to our view. Right. And, and, and you don't know that yet about your 2,000 stars. That's right. It, just, it sounds like it's a challenge. That's right. We are looking for the needle in the haystack. But if you find one habitable planet, that's, an, that's a huge discovery. That's worth it. That justifies all of this. OK. 
Dave has high hopes that the transit method is a great way to find habitable worlds. And he's not alone. After years of preparation, NASA just recently launched the Kepler Space Telescope. Over the next three or four years, Kepler will be looking towards the constellation Cygnus, keeping watch on more than 100,000 sun-like stars, searching for transiting planets. Since it's high above Earth's blurry atmosphere, Kepler has the ability to find a planet pretty much like our own, orbiting a star just like our sun. We want to find Earths. We want to know whether we're alone. And Kepler is the first mission that can find true twins of our Earth. Earth mass planets, Earth sized planets that orbit in an Earth-like distance. Of course, if and when we locate a livable planet, we'll want to know. Is anybody home? They're alive. And when I say anybody, I don't necessarily mean one of these movie guys. I'd be thrilled with signs of microbes. Yes. As we sniff out the chemistry of life on distant worlds, eventually, we should answer that question too. And the cool thing is, pretty soon, we'll know just where to look. We are just at the verge of finding these planets. We can answer a question that was asked thousands of years ago, maybe in five years, maybe in 10, but we'll answer it. We should know within our lifetimes whether there are other Earths and whether some or most of them are habitable, like our own Earth. What a, what a lucky time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs>